My name is Timothy. Everybody that cares about me calls me Timmy. And uh, I live in Baltimore. I moved here last year in January of 22. And I work from home upstairs in an office. And I'm here to be near my son who, who lives nearby. But besides him, I don't have any friends or even family in the area. And all my family is... Uh, kind of spread out, and when I moved here, I, I felt like I've got to plug into something. Uh, I'm not a church guy, so I went on Reddit, and I went on Facebook, and I was thinking, there's got to be like an open mic. There's got to be a place where we can get uh, get a little bit of, you know, a little extroverted heaven, you know, get out there, play some music, and... I come to find out about the depot, and thankfully it's like five minutes from my house, and I went out there and made a lot of friends, like right away. I, I felt like the people there were just very open-hearted, very open-minded, very fun people to be around, and it really made me feel like this is a place you can be yourself. You don't have to uh, have all the normal, you know, kind of, kind of, limitations you put on yourself when you're around you know your co-workers or even some people in your family like you can really just be yourself there and uh, I would say it was really cool for my wife Tori because she just started playing bass and she came out and did a Beastie Boys <laughs> uh, cover with me and she only knew how to play like just a one note or so but the joy on her face and knowing how shy she is, seeing her get up on stage and, and wear makeup and all this, it was just uh, uh, really meant a lot to me. Uh, three months later, mind you, I've only been to the open mic at this point probably nine, ten times. Uh, my wife, Tori, who is much fitter and healthier than I am, <laughs> uh, eats better than I do. Uh, she got diagnosed with uh, uh, heart failure. She just wasn't feeling well one day. And from April to July, she stayed in Johns Hopkins in a pretty pretty scary uh, emergency style setup for people that were dying. And I was around death every day. I slept, slept on a vinyl chair next to her hospital bed night after night and I couldn't I couldn't sleep I was eating out of a vending machine it was a horrible horrible time Wednesday Thursday Friday can't sleep Saturday not making any money she's not making any money bills keep coming Sunday Monday you just wanna you just wanna scream you just wanna cry but when Tuesday gets there I knew I could slip away to the depot just just for two or three hours, and and this guy, you know, Timmy, that guy who's gonna sing about spanking and streaking and just the most immature, juvenile, arrested development <laughs> BS that I sing about. It was cathartic. I could make jokes on this stage. I could sing my songs, and you'd meet the, the depot's the kind of place where somebody's having a drink with drumsticks in their pocket. Hey, I'm Timmy, what's your name? My name's Jack. Great, Jack, I'm up in five minutes. You want to play a song that you never heard before? Do I? <laughs> and we'd go up there and do like a like a scathing, awesome, tight cover of the White Stripes or something, and... Uh, those were precious, precious times. And what it meant for me was a chance I could, I could recharge. My social battery was charged. I was getting hugs and high fives and fist bumps from everybody. And it filled up my heart. I could go back to the hospital on Wednesday morning with a smile on my face and a teddy bear for Tori and say, hey, you're going to be okay. And uh, 
I don't think most of the people at the depot knew I was going through that, but a few of them did. Eli knew, Greg knew, Margaret knew, Sochi. Um, and it just felt so great being coming from this nightmare scenario to uh, a place where you hear people shouting your name. E even before my car is in park, Timmy's here! <laughs> and... Uh, as as we're moving so she can get better health care in North Carolina, and I might only have one more visit to the depot in me before this happens, um, I know that the depot is going to be in my heart, and no matter where I play and what I get to do, you know, <laughs> I don't expect it'll be much, but for whatever I get, the depot is always going to be irreplaceable to me. For, for what it did. Yeah. Definitely. It's, it's unfortunate, you know, that you guys, like, had to go through that, but it's it's pretty special that you had a place at least where felt things felt a little okay, you know, at least some of the time. And that's pretty good. At, at this point, are all of, is all the medical, the big stuff, like, behind you guys, and you're kind of at, like, a normal baseline, or is it still kind of, like, a big stressful thing that you have to worry about? That's it. Uh, the, the simple way of putting it is, is if you if I put someone else's heart in your body right now, mm -hmm. your body will treat it like a piece of glass or a rock mm -hmm. or a bullet and try to push it out. Mm -hmm. That's your immune system saying, wait a minute, this isn't my heart. And it's attached to all your veins and arteries. And so all the medical mumbo jumbo aside, what, what you have to do is you have to suppress your immune system almost like someone who has AIDS. Mm. You willfully, purposely, on purpose, <laughs> take pills that destroy your immune system so the heart can function. Mm. This means if I'm playing basketball, shooting hoops with the kids down the street, and I got germs on my hands that wouldn't bother, in fact, like the kind of germs you want your kids to get so they build an immune system. It could make her very sick. So she's always walking or washing her hands. She wears mm. a mask. And uh, it's tough. But with that, uh, it's been almost a year. And she's getting much, much better. And she, in a couple years, will be able to resume a lot of... She'll never be completely back the way she was. But uh, you never know. I, I don't think she's seen her last... Uh, appearance at the depot. Personally, <laughs> I think that uh, there might be a like a two, three year reunion get back up there. Hell yeah, definitely hope so. That'd be really cool. Yeah, you definitely. Um, I think that at the showcase a few weeks ago, uh, everybody was really moved by the song that you wrote about that experience. Was that? Did you write that like during that time, or was it kind of after the fact, after the hospital and everything? Well, thank you. It, it wasn't a, a great performance. I had a lot of technical issues, sadly, which uh, you know, I think a better performer kind of blocks it out. But uh, <laughs> I might have been a little affected. And then there's the emotion of it. But I wrote that while she was in the in the hospital, and I was just sitting on it for a, waiting waiting for like a really good time to to, to bust it out. And, and one day I'd like to record it and you know, pass it along you know, to my friends and stuff. Do a nice, clean recording. So if yeah. you know anybody that would like to record it, you know, send them my way. Nice. Yeah, it's definitely a special song. Um, I guess maybe just a couple more questions, if that's okay. Are sure. you doing okay on time? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So, like, when you... When you were, like, going through that, other than the depot, like, were there any kinds of like thoughts or things that that gave you hope or made you feel okay about the situation or like looking back after the fact do you feel like there was any things that you guys learned together going through that or was it just a really hard experience i don't think i ever thought she was not gonna make it um and uh, you know i i think i think uh some people would say i, I had a lot of courage um the truth is I was probably just in a lot of denial and the shock 
but somewhere in the middle is the truth. I, I was courageously denying it. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that when you really love somebody, you just, you really can't imagine things going. You, you, th you think about it once in a while, but you can't seriously imagine it. And, and that's, I just kept uh, thinking about one day, you know, being at the beach, throwing a little old Nerf football or something around, <laughs> and being on the other side of this. That's what kept me going. Definitely. Yeah, that's, that, that makes a lot of sense. I guess maybe a little bit of a lighter question. Um, like, how long have you been doing music for? Like, what got you into it? Were you ever in any bands, or has it always been kind of a solo thing? I used to do, uh, you know, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I just did like the church stuff when I was a little kid. And then we were in a church that was like, well, we don't do guitar. We just do hymns. And then uh, kind of got away from it for years. I've never actually been in, in a, your actual band. Um, but I'd like to be. And if it ever happens, I want to call it Captain Timmy and the Seaman. <laughs> That's mine. That's mine. <laughs> We're gonna wear sailor hats. Got it. It's a nautical theme. Old nautical nonsense. If Hell you like. yeah. It'll happen. I'll send you a seven-inch vinyl when we. <laughs> when we Hell yeah. That sounds that sounds pretty awesome. And like for how long? I guess like at what age did you stop doing all of like the churchy stuff? Well, I went to a Christian college. Uh, and I actually wrote a book about this. It's called Preacher Boy. If it, it, I didn't say it's good. I, I, it just exists. But uh, it was that or blowing my head off, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I was 22 and about to get divorced to my first wife, uh, who will go nameless. Uh, we had nothing in common. We only got married because you know, we were the first kiss for each other. And it, it was just that Christian college mm -hmm. thing. I voted for Obama. She did not vote for Obama. We, <laughs> we just became different people and once we uh, once we got out of uh, school I uh, actually became an atheist after like six years of theology studies. It was the most important thing to me and uh, I, I have a lot of friends that are still religious but for me personally I'm, I'm consider myself a humanist. Mm. We got divorced and uh, Got into a little bit of a dark period there, uh, but I discovered my love of music again when Tori came into my life. So we've been together since 2012, so 11 years now. Hell yeah. And she introduced me to Bon Iver, and uh, I got her into the Lumineers, and just everything in between, so. Nice. That's definitely awesome. Is, is music kind of like the main, like... Or I guess outside of your relationship, like, like the main like passion that's like in your life, or are there other things yeah. too? Yeah, yeah, but you don't have to, you know, be playing music to have music. You could, uh, you know, if if you uh, go to a beach and nobody's around, you decide to get naked and charge into the water. <laughs> that, that's something musical about that too. Or just putting your window down, you know, going for a ride, and you put your hand up. Uh, there's there's music in everything. Mm -hmm. And when when you absorb all that in, in real life, and you have something like a guitar, it just it just comes out. Mm. You just want to. Uh, I, I don't think that I create music so much as I, I, I'm like a translator. Mm. I'm just using this is uh, me translating my feelings about the world to you, and hoping that when you listen to the song, maybe you feel a little bit like. How I'm feeling. Yeah. I that's. I don't think I've ever heard it put that way, but um, I think that's like a very beautiful and like powerful idea, honestly. I, that it really resonates with me. Yeah. Like I'm just, I, I'm just a translator. Yeah, that's 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 pretty awesome, honestly. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. I guess. Um, so I also like I grew up Mormon and I left the church and stuff. Just wondering, were there were there any kind of like figures or or anything that really helped you kind of like leave religion, or was it a purely personal thing? I was in a class 
um, called Apologetics. Okay. And they're like, you know, the world's only 4,000 years old, and you're going to meet people out there um, who are going to tell you it's millions of years old, and there's dinosaurs and all this stuff. And they're like, so we need to have an answer for those people, but uh, if you don't read them in their own words, you're never going to stand a chance. So my <laughs> Christian professor um, encouraged me to read like Richard Dawkins, <laughs> 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 yes. Christopher Hitchens, Sam yeah. Harris, and a few others. Uh, and uh, after about uh, maybe nine months uh, after reading it, it's, uh, it's like if I believed I had my wallet in my pocket and I just checked that's what yeah. happened with religion I just one it's not that I threw it away mm -hmm. I woke up one day and I just didn't and, and then the talking animals just looked really bad <laughs> uh, after af, after that um, so <laughs> and the genocide and the, mm -hmm. the, the yeah <laughs> all the yeah. other things that are in there. Did you ever come across uh, James <laughs> Randi by any chance during that time? I met James Randi. You met James Randi? Yeah, very short in real life. What? Very short guy. How did you meet that guy? I met him at, uh, it was 2012, I want to say. Might have been 2011. Uh, it was something called the Reason Rally. Yep. R Richard Dawkins was speaking in Washington, D.C. James Randi was there. They had a bunch of videos from like Bill Maher and Penn Jillette. And Tim Minchin was there, if you know who he is, Australian comic, uh, pianist, uh, extraordinaire. Bad Religion played for three hours. Nice. <laughs> which was, that was my first exposure to Bad Religion. But uh, in my attempts to get Tim Minchin's attention, because he's a genius, look him up, that's M-I-N-C-H-I-N, Tim Minchin, absolute uh, brilliant. But uh, I see a little wizard character is like three feet tall and uh his husband and uh i was like fuck me it's james randy <laughs> uh so he was taking pictures uh, someone ha handed him a prop of uh, a wizard staff <laughs> and had him stand uh. like this and he's got a great sense of humor he actually gave me a hug oh, and nice. yeah and I said that I went to Liberty University, and he, he, he did this. He says, maybe, maybe there is a God, because that is a miracle that you could come out of that <laughs> and be here. Very funny guy. Wow. I'm, not, I'm not sure if he's still with us anymore. But Yeah, I can't remember if he passed recently or not. But, yeah, that's one of one of my, like, personal heroes. Like, when really? I was leaving the church, I found, like, all of his, his old shows from the 80s, like, debunking paranormal activity and stuff. I just would watch them on YouTube. And just like his personality was so down to earth, so yeah, I think I think that the skeptic community is pretty cool. Like I don't follow it hardcore, but I have a lot of respect for what they're doing. You know, I seem like pretty cool people. Yeah, I used to be kind of the the fedora atheist, yeah, killjoy, <laughs> but but uh, I would say now I'm like post religious mm -hmm. because if you make your whole identity, it, it's like religion still won. The damage is done. Yeah. You're still, I'm like oh well. You know, happy Easter to you. Get that, get that chocolate when it goes on sale Monday. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. I try to live and let live. Uh, I am very happy with where I'm at with it right now because it doesn't. Uh, I don't wake up feeling like a crusader on mm -hmm. one side or the other. It's, it's. I'm just not. I'm in a ceasefire right now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Which is nice. Heck yeah. So I guess, um, you know, now that you're coming up on your move, um, are there, like, any things that you're, like, looking forward to in the future or excited to find over in North Carolina? Yeah, um, I have, uh, kind, kind of, uh, since my dad died in 2011, right before I got, uh, Right, got, right, got with Tori. Uh, I've hovered between about 260 pounds and up to about 320, 330 pounds. And I've become so uncomfortable in my skin that it's uh, taken me to some really challenging places with my mental health. And 
I really, really needed help, it, it, but right now the thing that's a little bit more in vogue is like, no, you slay queen, be 330 pounds. <laughs> like, I appreciate the thought behind it, but like, I'm sweating tying my shoes and my arm is going numb. So yeah. maybe like also, maybe I can slay on the treadmill. Yeah. So see up that walk on the stair stepper, you know? Right. So I feel like moving to North Carolina, I'm in a good like I, I've just recently lost uh, uh, 25 pounds almost, so I feel like in North Carolina I can start kayaking and you know be a little crunchy. Maybe I'll grow a man bun. Start hiking. <laughs> yeah. So I'll be your size when I, uh, not quite, but I'll be a little smaller when I come back to Baltimore. Heck hopefully. yeah! You'll lose some weight and then I'll gain some weight and then yeah, we'll yeah, be, I'll give we'll you some. Right you want you want some? Let's <laughs> Heck okay. yeah. Let's we'll go to the surgeon and then swap a little bit of things. Let's go to the <laughs> Best of both worlds. The guy in the van, he'll do it for cheap. Heck yeah. That's awesome. Um, no, that's definitely good. I, I hope that you're able to find like that healthy lifestyle and, and feel comfortable with yourself. You know, It's a big... Uh, I guess like one of the best things you can do is like be active. You know, So that's a... Uh, good things coming, hopefully. Do you think uh, you'll ever come back to like visit Baltimore at any point? Well, I'll be up in the area quite a bit. Uh, my uh, nudist joint where I can camp for 50 bucks a night. <laughs> Much cheaper than a hotel, and you can't get in the hot tub like that at, <laughs> at Holiday Inn, so keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, but you're not my, supposed to. You're not supposed to. You <laughs> always do what you're told. So... <laughs> <laughs> but my son lives uh, nearby, so if I come up to to visit, uh, if I come up to visit him, uh, he's just forty minutes down the road. So I figure there's got to be a time where I come up. I spend Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Maybe I camp out one more night and I hunt the depot. Heck just yeah. drive back on Wednesday, sort of, yeah, kind of rub elbows with the with the fellas again. It'd be nice. And the, the fellas and the, and the ladies and both and neither and <laughs> got them all. Over Everything here. in between. Heck yeah, uh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, is there are there any anything that like you really want to say on camera like before I let you go? Um, appreciate it while it's happening. Uh, I'm a little older. And part of me wants to lie about my age so I can be cool and be one of the, the, the cool kids. But uh, I'm going to be 38 next month. Uh, I might not look it. Um, you don't know you're in the good old days until they're gone. Um, I see people come out and they put their name on the list and then they cross it out. And they leave at 9 o'clock. To, to lay in bed and doom scroll and uh, you gotta live your life while you're living one day you might have late stage heart failure one day you might go to a place like the depot and it's closed and you find out you know the, I don't mean to bring it all down but the optimum point of power in your life is now. Don't let the past determine who you are. Don't paralyze yourself worried about the future. If you can make a difference in someone's life, if you can bring somebody joy, wisdom, truth, love, beauty, or just tickle their ass, you know, do it now. Don't put it off. That's what I'd say. Yeah. Well, I definitely appreciate your time, Timmy. There's a lot of a lot of great stuff that you shared, so oh, thank you very you. much. And big shout out to Bailey, Christine, Eli, Sochi, the OG crew, everybody. You know who you are at the depot. I keep you in my heart forever.